I know of a family that lost a young father. They live in Northern California, able to have him buried at the cemetery near their home because they're all backed up with the pandemic and bodies from COVID. So an, an older grandma, his mother, had to choose a place for burial so the family can have closure. So she had to choose a cemetery that is about 40 miles away from where they live. I wanted to share that story because the pandemic is not only affecting people that die of COVID, but it's also affecting people um, that have other tragedies in their lives. I donned for, you know, since March, full PPE and a face mask and a mask over that so we could, you know, save the one underneath so it could last longer and goggles and and gloves and all of this stuff. And then I went to Texas and did it again, but more. And so I think I go to Walmart and somebody doesn't have their mask on and somebody asked them to wear it. They're like, that's my freedom. But I wore all those things to take care of other people's family. And in the end, I couldn't take care of my own. Welcome to LPTV's We're Speaking. I'm Maya May. And I'm Lisa Senecal. Every Wednesday, we're speaking with you about the most pressing issues facing our country, but with a twist. Our focus is the impact those issues are having on women and on raising up the voices of women working to make real lasting change and progress. And with so much of our country in pain, so many of us have lost friends and family members or know people who have. This immense collective loss has taken its toll. We're finally seeing progress, the approval of a third vaccine, increased vaccination rates. We have hit a milestone that would have sounded absurd a year ago this time. Over a half a million Americans lost to COVID-19 and millions more who have been left behind to process this grief. And that's why we're devoting our show today to talk about individual and collective loss and trauma and the ways we can support one another and take care of ourselves and help our communities in moving forward post pandemic. First, we have two women who through their grief came together and created a Facebook group that's grown to nearly 
thousand people who have lost loved ones due to COVID-19. We'll also be speaking with Dr. Sherry Cormier, a psychologist and bereavement specialist who authored the book, Sweet Sorrow, Finding Enduring Wholeness After Loss and Grief. And later we'll be joined by Dr. Jetta Robinson, an author, educator, entrepreneur, and a grief and trauma therapist. We'll be talking with her about COVID-19 induced trauma and how that overlaps with existing trauma in the black community. Now we all know that sharing our stories helps others who are also going through the grieving process. So we would love to hear from you, share a photo or a memory of a loved one who has passed away during the pandemic. You can also leave us a voicemail at 646-374-8339 or tweet us using hashtag we're speaking. Um, you can also leave a comment for us on Facebook. Debbie Roberts from Facebook wrote us, my family lost two immediate family members in 2020. The grief and loss has been almost unbearable. I still cry daily for them and miss them so much. I'm also a nurse and working in the age of COVID has been a strain mentally, physically, and emotionally. We have tried to honor the family members we lost by continuing to live. I know that's what they would have wanted and expected from us. I'm just so tired. We also heard from Wendy. She reached out to us via Facebook. My sister passed away on March 9th due to Alzheimer's disease. She lived in Arizona while I lived in New Hampshire. And during the early 70s, she and her husband welcomed me into their home for college vacations after our parents died. Without her, I would have had to scramble for some place to stay during semester and spring breaks. Uh, there's so much pain out there right now. And our, our first two guests are all too familiar with it. Um, Angelina Proya and Sub Sibila Khan both lost their fathers to COVID-19 and their experiences of loss are shared by millions of people around the world, but so many people are grieving in isolation. Angelina and Sibila did something really special. They recognized that too common experience of loss and created a community on Facebook for people who share their experiences, which now numbers more than eight thousand members. Angelica and Sibila, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's it's really wonderful to have you here. Sibila, I want to uh, start with you. Um, your dad was a community organizer. Can you tell us um, a little bit about him? And also, do you feel as though you're carrying on his legacy of pulling community together together um, with your work in this group? I, uh, I do. My father was an extraordinary, extraordinary man. He was the truest example of a solid, good and reliable human being who devoted so much of his time and energy to supporting his community. Um, he, we were undocumented ourselves for many years when we first moved to the United States. And my father spent all of his time trying to amplify the voices of people who didn't have access to cut red tape, you know, be it with housing issues or getting people jobs. And later on, um, he started a nonprofit meant to increase the voter registration base among the Pakistani American community here in Jersey City. Um, and yes, I do feel like, you know, obviously when I started this group, I wasn't thinking about the connection between my father's work uh, and what I was doing. I started the group for selfish reasons. I wanted to talk to other people who were experiencing what I was going through, which was, it was such an isolating pain. And um, I really do see a beautiful through line between his work and what I'm doing now. It's really, really beautiful. And I'm so appreciative that you're sharing that with us. Um, Angelina, you lost your dad to COVID as well. Can you tell us a bit about him and how this group honors his memory for you? Um, well, my father died on April 16th and um, he was um, 
my father was a big kid um, and he wanted to live his life in such a way that he was always having fun and um, experiencing everything that he could. Um, he had a, he had a huge heart. Um, he was a warm, kind, generous, gentle person. And I think that my father would want people to have a place to grieve, especially in, in the current climate that we're in where COVID is not taken seriously or people question the cause of death or they they minimize it and invalidate it in, in a plethora of ways. Um, and I think that my father, um, with his kind and gentle soul, would want people to have a safe place. And, and that's really um, where it comes from for me. I mean, not only to have a place to grieve, but to continue his kindness um, in my own life. Thank you both so much for sharing the photos of both of your dads with us. It's it's so important to humanize these numbers and and being able to see those photos is is um, doing that for us. And and we really want you to know that we see your dads. Um, sorry, I'm going to get choked up a lot tonight. So just everybody bear with me. Um, Sabila, I want to start uh, this question with you and Angelina. I'd love for you to answer it too. You've talked about a little bit about what you've both gotten out of putting this uh, group together. What do you think the people, these 8,000, almost 8,000 people who are now part of it, what do you think they are getting from it? They're finding community in a time where we're hungry for community. When you're grieving the loss of a loved one, we have funerals and rituals and ceremonies marking death for a reason. These processes help us have closure. And in a time when we're unable to, to have any of these rituals, my father's burial was live streamed for us on our phones. Um, we couldn't be to come together as a family and as a community. So I think this is a space where people can take comfort in their shared experience of unimaginable trauma. And we have about 8,000 members now. About 7,700 of those members are active on a daily basis, which shows you the need for community, for understanding, for, you know, we don't want our pain minimized. We want our pain validated and, and recognized. We, wanna, we want to bear witness to each other's grief. And I think that's, that's very powerful. Yeah, in incredibly so, um, especially because of so many of the, the common experiences that you're able to share with each other. I mean, when, so everybody logs in pretty regularly. Is, is it, you know, just, is it sharing photos? What are the kind of things that people uh, do when they come into the group? Are they sharing, you know, just kind of how their day is going? Do you, um, okay. they, oh, do you wanna go? Sorry. Uh, they're, they're they they can share. I mean, they share things like how their loved one died or um, their experience, whether they were able to be there with them when they died, if they were lucky enough to get a Zoom phone call, if they were lucky enough to see them in the casket. Um, you know, how long they spent on the ventilator, if they were able to get a ventilator, if they were able to get a test. Um, they they share these these different nuanced details that are that are exclusive to losing a loved one to COVID. And, and I've said this, my my uncle was murdered when I was 15, and that loss was easier to bear than this. Um, I mean, the lack of community. I mean, being able to hug someone at a funeral. I mean, like Sibila said, I'm just going to piggyback off of what she said. I mean, that is a necessary thing that, that our group provides. I mean, that sense of community, that sense of understanding and that sense of validation that in this, again, this, this current climate, it, it's, it's unfortunately available in pockets of society and not widespread. And, and we're one of those pockets. So with COVID, the, the disease and coverage of it is just omnipresent. It's, it's hard for anyone to get away from it. Both of you have taken that up a level 
by moderating this group. So you're you're even more in it all the time. How are you taking care of yourselves? How are you finding time to be able to remove yourself from from the grief, um, even temporarily, to really be able to do some self care? And I'll I'll start with you, Sabila. I'm sitting in the grief. I've been sitting. I did the math. I've been sitting in the grief for 319 days. We're we're about um, to mark the one year anniversary of my father's death next month, and it goes back to carrying on my father's legacy. For me, bearing witness to these COVID deaths every day, carrying the community, carrying other people's grief, is really giving me a sense of purpose, and it's helping me heal in a way that I don't think anything else would. Um, I am doing some meditation. We have a couple of members of our group who are now offering free meditation classes that I have started taking and I've never done meditation in my life, but that has been a huge, huge help. But other than that, I'm just throwing myself into the work and trying to you know, I couldn't be with my father at the end. He died alone and scared. I feel like I just never saw him again after the last time I saw him in, in on March 11th. Um, and I feel like by doing this work, I'm keeping his memory alive. Angelina, are you finding ways to be able to care for yourself while you're simultaneously caring for so many other people? Well, the honest answer to that question is a resounding no. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, in spreading myself um, into this group and into, you know, I have a family of my own to support. So um, no, I, I haven't found a lot of um, time for self-care, but I imagine that it will come. I think right now we're still in the thick of it. And um, other than caring for my family, I need to care, care for this, this group of people and really be, you know, a voice for people who've lost loved ones to COVID. So I'll get the time for self-care later. And, and I know that a lot of people will disagree with that. But, but I'm sure when, when we're able to travel again and when we're able to do those things that, that you know, we, we have taken for granted, um, that, I, that I will do that. I'm, I'm would love to take a nice trip somewhere, but it, it's got to wait. Um, there's more important things to do right now. And at some point, you know, I, I will get around to self-care. Thank you for saying that, Angelina, because it's a breath of fresh air to hear someone be so candid about what healing looks like. And that sometimes like self-care is just trying to get through the day. You know, I think sometimes we judge ourselves and feel like, oh, I have to do this. I have to do that. And I think it's helpful for a lot of people to, to hear that uh, and to know that it's okay to say, no, um, I'm not okay. Are these kind of some of the conversations um, that y'all have in the group, Sabila? Do you set up uh, different like, you know, parameters for what people can communicate about? Well, yes, uh, there's no politics in our group, which was rule number one, uh, because COVID, Angelina and I both agreed, was an equal opportunity killer, and everyone is deserving of community and comfort. Um, and we wanted, from very early on, our space to be one of support. And we're now trying to figure out ways to help our community be productive in their just in the way that Angelina and I have found so much comfort in being productive in our grief. So as I mentioned before, we offer free meditation classes now. We highlight and spotlight members, other members who have been able to, to create something beautiful out of their grief, be it a foundation or an organization. Uh, a member of ours is um, right now having a drive to, to encourage people to get vaccinated. Um, so we're highlighting members, um, and we're also, even though we're not a political space, we are also connecting our members with 
with groups that are more political. If that's how they want to channel their grief, we're giving them those opportunities. We're, we're, we're giving them those contacts. Um, and as far as the group goes, I mean, we, we just want people to be supportive, to be kind and gentle to one another, um, and, and help others figure out how, how to grieve in this time and in this space. So it's become, especially now, because we have so many members who are joining who have just lost a loved one. And then you have members like Angelina and myself who are coming upon a year. So I'm seeing this beautiful thing where older members are now becoming mentors in a way to younger, to, to newer members um, and helping guide them through uh, the pain. So that's happened very organically. So Angelina, can you tell us who the group is open to and how do people, how do people find you? Well, they can just do um, a search. We are, um, I believe, facebook.com slash group slash COVID loss support. Um, I think that the most direct way to find us is either that or um, just typing in their search bar, COVID loss support for family and friends um, will probably be one of the first few groups to um, pop up um, and and they would have to send us a request and um, we we tend to approve most people unless there are some glaring red flags or they're pretty obviously a troll account um, but we we tend to approve everyone and we we encourage people to join and we accept invitations and and we are just trying to build and, and reach as many people as we can right now so I absolutely love uh, hearing about how the group has evolved and how y'all have sort of evolved with yeah. it. Uh, you know, because I'm sure going into it, it felt very just like grassroots. And now um, it's growing to support so, so many people. Do you, um, do you feel like this is something that I, I, I can imagine it's taking uh, a, a lot of your time? Is this something that you could see yourself doing full time as far as creating these support networks for people? Me personally, no. Uh, I work in the book publishing industry. Um, okay. I, I, I don't know. I mean, listen, life is full of surprises and I don't know where this will take me. Maybe, maybe I, I, I love I love what I'm doing. I love my day job, but I also love what I'm doing here in supporting other people. And I feel like I have a knack for it, which I, which is a little bit of a surprise to me. I don't know why it is. Yeah, I think it's, it, it is always a uh, surprising crisis kind of teaches us a lot about who we are. And so I'm just super impressed that you've been able to create something positive um, out of your grief and trauma and been able to help other people in, in, in doing so. So it's, it's, I'm very impressed because I know I would probably just be curled, you know, curling up in a ball and crying for, <laughs> for most of the day. So um, this has been really, really uh, incredible, truly. Yeah. Thank you both of you so much for the work you're doing and for coming on and talking with us about it. It's um, you're helping so many people and, and I'm sure it's so many more people than you realize because all those members that you have of that group are supporting other people as well. So it's it's a beautiful ripple effect that you're having. So thank you. Thank you so much for having us on. And I just want to end by saying that for the death, there are nine close family members left behind. So right now our country, it, over 4.6 million Americans are COVID bereaved. Um, so we want to reach out to as many people as we can and support them. So thank you for the opportunity for spreading the word. Thank you. Thanks for coming in and talking thank with you. us, both of you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So as we can see, sharing our stories truly is the way that we are going to get through this. It's that empathy um, and understanding. So uh, please feel free to give us a call and leave us a voicemail, 646-374-8339. And you can tweet us, hashtag we're speaking, or leave a comment for us on Facebook. 
Yeah. And, and I wanted to go ahead and I'm going to try to get through this. Um, I lost my mom this year. So I was one of the people who posted um, in response this week. This is my beautiful mom, Joan, who passed away at the end of October of last year. Um, fortunately, um, my sisters, my dad and I were all able to be with her and care for her at home. Um, and she's left a legacy um, for us of just loving deeply and working hard and doing whatever we can to try to make uh, people's lives better. So it is it is my deep honor to be able to try to carry on the work that my mom did. And I know my dad and and sisters and all of her grandchildren feel the same way. So thank you, everyone, for giving me an opportunity to honor her here. Thank you, Lisa. And this is where it's like, I want to be able to reach through the internet to the computer and give you a big hug. Um, Cause I know that's what uh, so many of us need right now is really um, yeah. just a hug. Just a hug. Yeah. People aren't supposed to be processing grief the way, the way we are right now. It's a very odd, sterile um, environment to be doing that in and completely unnatural. Um, so thank you. I'll, I'll take the virtual hug and I know we're going to be talking with our next two guests um, more about how people are processing that and, and healthy ways that we can do that. Yes. And so many of you have opened up and shared your grief and healing process with us. Um, Diane from Facebook writes, I lost my beautiful mother to COVID the day after Christmas. While cleaning out her apartment, we found her signed vaccine consent form so close. It did not have to be this bad. And we heard from Lizanne at the top of our show. She's a traveling nurse from Oklahoma who has been on both sides of the pandemic. And as an essential worker and who lost two loved ones in a short period of time, her mother and her husband. Uh, in her own words and photos, a tribute from Lizanne to her mom and husband. Neither one of them were ready to die. You know, the virus is, it's just, it's just vicious. My husband, he worked out all the time, a lot. Um, um, he adopted our son, Brayden, and they used to do like push-up contests. And, you know, he was, he was just, so funny and if you were having a down day you know he would turn on some music and say what what's that I hear huh and then he would just start dancing everybody just loved him and I've gotten so many messages about you know just what a nice guy he was and he was always joking around and you know, he loved football games nobody's ever said anything negative about him and he's he was so funny and gentle and you know would jump in to help anybody and we had we worked very hard to put our youngest through law school and we kept thinking you know we were going to get our dream home as soon as we got him through law school and um we we found our dream home and we moved in last uh, march of 2019. a lot of people are still suffering and you know we didn't have funerals for either one of them and we didn't have celebrations of life and we didn't have anything we didn't have a living room full of people telling stories and laughing and crying and, oh my gosh, you remember that one story? We didn't have any of that. I feel all of these things and I've lost all of this and I feel like I did everything right, you know? And it just, it just doesn't matter, you know? It doesn't matter. We're joined now by Dr. Sherry Cormier. Um, she's a psychologist and a certified bereavement trauma specialist. She's also the author of Sweet Sorrow, Finding Enduring Wholeness After, Lo After Loss and Grief, which chronicles the decade following the loss of her husband, her father, her mother, 
and her only sibling. Uh, Dr. Cormier, thank you so much for being here oh. with us today. That's uh, unimaginable loss to, to list that off. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really feel, I really feel grateful to be here. It's an honor for me to be here and just listening, you know, listening, Lisa, about uh, the loss of your mom, listening to Angelina and Sabila and what a, what an incredible thing that they are doing in creating community for all of these people impacted by COVID loss. We, we know over 500,000 people have died and for every one person, there's around nine people that are directly impacted by that loss. So there are many, many, many people. And, and as they were saying, there's, there's not a lot of place to take our grief right now. And my heart just goes out to, to all of you. And I'm incredibly blessed to be here tonight. Oh, thank you. We're, we're really fortunate to have you here. Um, what you were just saying is, is so so true that um, just the way we're experiencing grief and loss right now is, um, I, I think as a nation, uh, sort of culturally, we're just not very good at it to begin with. We're very mm -hmm. uh, grief avoidant, uh, especially when it's someone else grieving. But now we're all collectively grieving while at the same time being so isolated from one another. How do you think this is affecting how we're all processing grief? Well, I, I, I just agree. First, I agree with everything that you just said. And I'm not exact. You know, I think that some of us are more, some are more open with our grief. And I think that we are more transparent with grief. I think we are getting a little bit more comfortable with grief. Uh, but I, but I also think that generally speaking, in Western society, uh, we are not accustomed to suffering. We don't like to suffer. We're resistant to suffering, and so this whole pandemic of being exposed to uh, COVID, and and you know, we've been living, not only witnessing uh, all these people dying, and I, my heart really goes out to healthcare workers now too, who I think are taking a lot of the brunt of grief because they're being exposed to it over and over and over again. But I, I just think that um I think that in general we 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 just don't want to suffer. We we resist it. And so I think this whole year has brought up a lot of the notion of what does it mean to have to confront suffering? And I also think one of the things that's really been challenging, uh, first of all, I think we've all lost something or someone, even if we haven't lost a person uh, to COVID or something else, and COVID is it's sort of a unique loss. You know, I think we've just lost something. We've lost a way of life. We've lost rhythms because of masking and physical distancing. We've lost you know, a lot of our social connection and our brains are really wired to be in contact with other people and to touch and to hug. And, you know, all of that has been missing for so long. And it's particularly challenging for people who have lost someone uh, who are grief survivors, you know, whether it's to COVID or uh, Black Lives Matter, um, police brutality. I mean, there's many, many ways that people have lost someone this year. And I think one of the challenges, too, has been that we've all been living under this sort of cloud of worrying about, will I die? I think it's brought up this tremendous fear of death. You know, I've heard children, you know, who get a little bit of news but not enough news, but a little bit of news. And they'll say to their, their uh, parent or caregiver or maybe grandma or grandpa, am I going to die from this? And I think that there's this, this cloud hanging over us 
I think we're starting to see a little hope now with the vaccines coming out. But we've been living under this cloud for a year of our own fear of dying, watching other people die, not having any either individual or familial or community or collective place really to take our grief, which is what makes that Facebook group so so much more important really mm-hmm. to have to have that available. Yeah. It, you know, it's so overwhelming. And I think because there wasn't really a a moment in time where we were like, oh, it's going to stop. Uh, and so we're reaching this point where at least I find like people are crying more than I've seen like publicly crying. Like I've been on conference calls and work calls and things like that. And so have you noticed or do you feel like this is going to change our, the way we process grief? Are we going to be more open with the way we process grief? Are we going to be okay with bursting into cries? Because I, at this point, I think that it's pretty healing to know that you can cry and someone isn't going to go, oh, why are they crying? <laughs> Maya, oh, I I love that. I mean, I totally agree with you. I hope that we will become more open to grief. I think we are seeing, I would say, really just even in the last six weeks, I think we've seen more national focus, more national discussion about pandemic grief and grief in general. And I do certainly concur with you about, um, I think people are feeling more free you know, one of the things that's really important in in grief work, in processing your grief, is to feel your feelings, is to give voice. You know, the title of your show, Speak Your Feelings. And um, so I think people are feeling a little more free to do that. I do think we are crying more. And for, you know, sometimes I'll find myself just, in the middle of the day, I'll be at home. I'm usually at home. I live alone. I'm still single. Um, that's something to cry about, I guess, too. But, um, you know, I'll just feel teary. I'll feel teary. You know, I'll get, you know, and then sometimes it's good crying. I mean, I'll see, like, things, I think maybe our hearts are getting more open. And so sometimes, when that happens, we're we're more um, aware of things that are going on that we need to really feel. We need to feel because if we don't feel, we're numb. And when we're numb, we sort of don't care about things. We need to be feeling things, and we are feeling things more. I don't know exactly what things are going to look like on the other side of the pandemic a year from now. Um, I think we're in the middle of what I would call a big reset now. I think it's a, we have a great opportunity. We've had all of this loss, we had all of this pain, all of this suffering, uh, the likes of which we really have not seen in our country for a while, for some years, and globally probably, probably, you know, since World War II. So I don't know what's going to happen. I'd like to think that our hearts will be more open. We will stay more open. We will be much more cognizant of what is going on in the world, what is going on uh, in terms of inequalities. We will be more, much more aware of inequities. We will be more committed to inclusivity. I, I certainly hope you're right. I spend a lot of time thinking about what life on the other side of the pandemic is, is going to look like. Um, and, and part of what I wonder about is because we're not processing grief in a normal way, that it, it comes out somewhere. <laughs> you, you can't it just does. decide that you're not going to grieve and, and oh, it, it's going to find it, its way out. So yeah. what do you, how do you see, how do you think that is going to manifest itself? Because this is such a mass scale mm-hmm. of, of grief right now. I think there's that one of the things I'd really like to say is that 
we don't really consider grief to be a clinical disorder because it's a, you know, it's sort of a normal human reaction to something emotionally painful. And we all experience loss at some point during our lives. Um, and grief is a human response to that. But I do think that we can try to shut down grief. And because it's uncomfortable, it feels uncomfortable. And so many of us, I think, grew up in families where we might have been told not to cry, uh, not to feel our feelings, not to speak. Uh, I, I know so many people that they would have a loss in their family and the person would never be talked about again, you know, as if they had not existed. So there is uh, the potential, though, for a, a clinical disorder in grief that we call prolonged grief, which is really when you sort of can't process grief, you can't move through it. I want to be really clear that, that we don't, I don't think we move on from grief. I think we move through grief. I think the task is to integrate grief into our lives and that we continue to live. And we do so in a way like, like Sabila and Angelina said, we do so in a way that really honors the legacy of the, of the person or, or people that we have lost. But I do think there may be in resp direct response to your question, Lisa, I am a little concerned there could be a potential for more complicated or prolonged grief after the pandemic because it, there is so, such a mass amount of grief and we are so devoid of what we need. I mean, we, we need community and we don't have it. So many of us didn't, we were not there when our loved ones died from COVID. We didn't get to say goodbye. They died, you know, this is really even hard for me just to think about. They died, uh, you know, in a, in a room alone if they were in the critical care unit. We know that healthcare workers have really stepped up to help them. Um, but, and then we haven't had the rituals that we really need. We really need our services and our funerals and we need the camaraderie of other people and our brains need that. Uh, that's partly how we heal from, from grief and loss. So I would imagine that we are, we will have a more extended period of grieving even after the pandemic. And I, I think that we really need to have, we need to keep having so many conversations about grief and loss and really give people permission to feel what they're feeling, to feel the loss, to speak about their feelings, to own their grief journey, because we know that even though grief is a universal phenomenon, that no two people grieve exactly the same way, but to, you know, to really be able to own the journey. And, um, and I also think that, you know, we, we have to think when somebody close to us dies, that sometimes a part of us dies. And, you know, so we're not only grieving our dad or our partner or, you know, our, our son or daughter or grandchild, we're, we're also grieving what died in us when that, ha when that loss or that, those series of losses happened. And so being able to go through all those things and then even to sort of imagine if there could be any seeds of growth that are being planted and that they will come up. You know, we know if we, if we know anything about gardening, that there are plants called perennial plants. And I have a lot of them in my, in my garden. And they go dormant in the winter and they look dead. And you think this, you know, echinacea coneflower plant is never going to come up again, or my hosta plant will never come up again. And yet my daffodils will never come up again, but you know, they're already up that much. And so thinking about imagining the seeds is gross. So 
there are these processes that we really do need to go through. I think the more conversations we can have, especially collectively, because grief is really isolating. Even in non-COVID situations, and my losses that you mentioned that I talk about in my book, Sweet Sorrow, they all occurred before COVID. Even in non-COVID times, but particularly in COVID, grief is very isolating. Um, the person who's grieving feels set apart from other people. And a, a lot of people, a lot of other, you know, we, we sort of don't know how to respond to people who are going through grief. And so sometimes when we are going through grief, we feel alone because the people around us don't, don't know how to respond and they become impatient with their own grief journey. Uh, and then COVID with physical distancing and then everything in place with, you know, going on lockdown and then everything online and not having uh, rituals. It, it's just made the isolation much more challenging. I think it, it, you're a hundred percent right. And I really like um, the thought that you had about um, the seed and the plant analogy. I love a good metaphor and analogy. And I think you're um, so right. I wish we had more time with you because I want to go further into that, but I think it's a really nice too. moment to, to kind of end on because yes, we, we can, we can be seeds that can flower again every year. And so I think it's an, uh, important to remember that, that uh, grief uh, doesn't have to consume us entirely and forever. So um, really uh, appreciate you being here with us tonight and sharing all of these thoughts. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. speaking about this on your program. So important. Thank you very so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is, uh, this, I'm getting so many tips, uh, a lot of stuff to think about. We will be yeah. right back uh, after this quick message from the Lincoln Project. When you get booed at CPAC and you're Ted Cruz, like that means that literally there are 8 billion people on this planet, 7,999,999,000 people loathe you and you're the only person who doesn't. You can subscribe and listen to the latest episode of the Lincoln Project podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever else podcasts are found. Um, we are going to um, switch gears because I think switch we up. all need to take a moment <laughs> to uh, kind of uh, regroup, shake it off. And uh, one of my ways of coping is to be incredibly snarky. And so with it is with great pleasure that um, we are going to uh, talk about the Offs Awards. Each week, we like to take a few minutes to shine a spotlight on a few folks whose actions have exceeded our expectations in being deceitful, dishonest, and anti-democratic. And we give them an award for it, our Oh For Fuck's Sake Award. It's our way of saying, we see you failing at being a decent human being. So folks, here are this week's nominees. First up, we have Madison Cawthorn. Madison's relationship with the truth is complicated. Declared dead after his friend left him in a fiery tomb? Lie. Accepted to the prestigious Naval Academy? Lie. Accused by 150 former classmates of being a sexual predator? True. But it's his lies that got him elected to Congress, where he did some more lying, helped incite an insurrection, blamed it on Democrats, and attended CPAC to spew the big lie. Ha, ah, I'd hate to play two truths and a lie with this guy. Yeah, next up tonight is Nikki Haley. Poor Nikki can't decide if she's a critic or an apologist for Donald Trump. Nikki has become a human weather vane and she flips herself around whichever way she thinks the political winds are blowing. She once represented the future of the Republican Party and 
you know, honestly, I think she still does. Um, she holds no principles or convictions. Her integrity is shot to hell. And she's willing to do or say whatever she needs to to keep her fading hopes of ever holding office again alive. And certainly, uh, <laughs> we've got one more, a good one, Mitch McConnell. Oh, acquitted Trump stated unequivocally that Joe Biden won the election and Trump was responsible for inciting a violent insurrection and then said he would absolutely support Trump for the 2024 nominee. Huh? What? It can't be all of those things. <laughs> like, enough said. <laughs> uh, yeah. And you know, after CPAC this past weekend, many of you might be asking yourselves how the former guy is not one of this week's nominees. And that's because we thought we should just go ahead and give him the oh for fuck's sake lifetime achievement award, declare him ineligible for nomination from this point forward, and you know try not to give him any more attention because he really does not deserve our attention. And besides, it's a made up award, so we can do whatever we want. That we can, and he already has a golden life size replica of himself as a trophy. <laughs> We sent him that, uh, but, but legit <laughs> voting on our nominees is still happening. So you can cast your vote in the offs poll. It's live on our Twitter at LPTV, and we'll announce the winner of the losers at the end of the show. Uh, so get to voting and we'll be right back with Dr. Jetta Robinson. Uh, but first a voicemail from one of our viewers. I think we have a voicemail from Hi, my name is Tricia Templeton. I'm an Episcopal priest in Atlanta. I've done nine funerals in the past year. Um, fortunately, none of them COVID-related, but all of them we've had to do outside with a limited number of people. We haven't been able to be in the church. We haven't been able to sing hymns. We haven't been able to have a reception afterwards um, for people to gather and share stories and express um, comfort to those who are grieving. Um, I haven't been able to be in the hospital to give people last rites. Um, and I even had to do my own father's funeral this way. So it's, it has been um, tremendously hard, both for those who are grieving and for those of us whose, whose calling is to help people through these times of life. Yeah, I mean, it, it's none of this is normal, um, and that's why I'm so glad we have Dr. Jetta Robinson uh, with us today. She is an author, educator, entrepreneur, grief therapist, and a self-described trauma and poverty disruptor. I am so happy you're here. <laughs> Thank you for Thank coming. Thank you so much for tonight. having me. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, okay, um, we are talking about grief now. Um, this is something, trauma, grief, that you have worked in uh, for quite some time. Could you talk about what it is to name the pain, to name the injury? Absolutely. In the grief and trauma world, we talk a lot about the importance of naming um, what we are seeking to heal from. We really have a difficult time um, creating healing, creating support, creating some of the honoring rituals that are necessary to create a life post loss. If we don't acknowledge what the loss is, if we don't acknowledge what the wound is, it's the same way that if you go to the doctor with an infection, we got to figure out what type of, you know, infection you have. So we know what type of treatment is necessary to heal that. It's the same thing with grief and trauma. Um, the way that we might approach um, a physical loss or a symbolic loss versus a traumatic injury or loss might be slightly different. The work that is needed to kind of stabilize someone really depends on the nature of the loss and the factors that contribute to that loss, as well as their pre-loss functioning. Um, I think a lot of us talk about the injury itself, but we also want to talk about the health of the individual prior to the loss, because that predicts and, and, and impacts the resources internal and external one might have to mobilize, to resolve, or to name and heal from the loss that has been occurred. That's such um, an important point. I'm so glad that this is something that you talk about, that the state that somebody was in before the loss um, 
there is there was so much ongoing trauma in so many communities, but especially the black community before COVID ever hit. And so there, there are just these layers of um, the trauma of injustice and the trauma of COVID and now job losses and poverty and uh, our kids being home and kids not getting educated. How do you define the collective pain and how do we how do we begin processing so many different layers and helping people move forward because COVID's going to end, but a lot of this other stuff is not going anywhere quickly. I think it's important to acknowledge um, the notion of both primary and secondary losses, right? And so a primary loss that we may have encountered because of COVID may be um, a loss of income, but the other secondary loss might be the global loss of safety. And we got to reconcile that those compound and they accumulate. Um, particularly with the African-American community, we also have um, the complexity of race as a factor that may contribute to economic instability that may contribute to access issues. Um, you know, racial and microaggressions have not gone away. They have been compounded as a result of this. And so I think this is also the importance of naming the stressors, the losses, as well as the, the changes in access and resources that might help us um, manage those losses. And so I think about some of our folks in the African-American community who are disproportionately impacted by being exposed to COVID as a result of um, some of the you know, being on the front line, right, of uh, some of these careers that they have more likely to be in service-based industries that still were essential but are not paid or valued as essential. And so there's higher risk exposure there, but there's also lower access to adequate health care. There's also the mistrust of health care, the disproportionate or disparity in health care outcomes for this population, and not because of pre-existing um, genetic factors, but simply because we are treated differently in healthcare systems. And so that compounds the loss of safety, the loss of trust that we experience even when we're navigating seeking support. Um, and if we only focus on the outcomes that help indicators that show that we are at higher risk without recognizing how we how we got there, we further disenfranchise this population and perhaps even blame them and us for those outcomes. And so that creates an, another loss, right? And so I think it's important that we have to own the systems, um, historical, social, political, um, cumulative and cultural in the United States particularly that contribute to the unique and unshared experience that African-Americans have long faced and navigated in this country. And so I think we, we have to continue to put words um, and truth to those lived stories and experiences. Uh, I really appreciate this because just in the moments that we've been talking, you've given us like very specific language on how to talk about uh, grief. And you talk about these losses, primary and secondary loss. I think that's the first time I've heard this kind of terminology. For people who don't have access to uh, maybe therapy resources or things like that, can you break down a little bit um, more about how to identify for any one person who's going something, how they can identify what particular loss or trauma that they're going through and what are some steps they could take to kind of uh, start to work on it and process it? Absolutely. And so in addition to primary and secondary losses, loss and, and grief really occurs in um, or falls in two main categories. Um, physical losses, we often think about these as someone's, someone has died, um, we've lost a limb, there's a physical, tangible component to the loss. Those are more readily recognizable. The support that we have is more readily in place for those even in this virtual space or this socially distant space. And then there are symbolic losses. And these are the ones that I worry about um, more because they're often the ones that are intangible. These are the ones that look like loss of safety, loss of identity, loss of income, loss of stability, even loss of routines, right? Um, loss of, of normality. We, we don't know what life looks like post-COVID, post this post-racial America we think we've encountered, um, post whatever the, the loss might be. Um, and that in and of itself can create a cumulative and compounded effect. And so some things that we can do um, is to really identify 
what was happening? What was the transition? Oftentimes, losses are indicated by a transition or a decrease in functioning. Um, For those of us who have experienced cumulative losses um, or uh, cumulative traumatic exposures, we might not see a loss in functioning. We might actually see an increase in productivity because for many of us, hyperproductivity is a trauma response. And so I always look for the transition for the change, both increase or decrease in behaviors um, and symptoms in restlessness and sleep and concentration, because those are usually the indicators of whatever the, tr- the trigger was, whether it's physical or symbolic loss, whether it's traumatic or not, that usually helps paint the story about um, what was the precipitating event Um, And that can sometimes be tough because they're cumulative. They're multiple that might be happening at the same time, right? Workplace stress, microaggressions, COVID, Um, loss of a loved one, um, loss of job, COVID, right? And so we very rarely, especially if you're a marginalized uh, group, have these single incident losses. We have the cumulative and complex nature. And it's important that we, we honor that the symbolic losses trigger the same grief response. The body doesn't know that, oh, well, that is a physical loss or symbolic loss. It doesn't differentiate. It's geared toward survival. And so it will engage in the same grief and loss process, regardless of what type of loss it is. I, I worry so much about um, kids and how they're processing all of this. It's, it's difficult enough for adults to, it's impossible for adults to get our heads fully around what's happening, but for kids to be able to put words to what they're going through, um, I worry once schools are fully reopened and, and classrooms are full again with so many traumatized kids, even more than we already had. And we had a lot of traumatized kids before COVID. Um, And and a a piece of my concern is the measuring one loss against Mm -hmm. another, what, what one person has suffered, you know, why are you reacting the way you are? You didn't lose anybody, but but there could be pre-existing trauma there. Yeah. There's, there's Mm -hmm. so much more to an individual response than just what that, that one incident was. Do you feel like we um, at all have the resources inside our schools or what should we be doing to prepare uh, teachers and counselors and administrators when kids, I mean, everybody, and this is, this is going to be showing up in, in lunch rooms. Everybody's Absolutely. going to need to know how to deal with this. So do you have thoughts on what can we be doing that we're not right now to prepare our, our schools for traumatized kids? Absolutely. So we have to equip educators, anyone working with children to be able to recognize how grief shows up differently for kids. I think we make the mistake of believing that children grieve the way that adults do, and it is simply not the case. Um, The notion that we think that children will simply tell us what they're feeling is imposing our way of processing our developmental stage onto kids. Play is the language of children. And so if we force them to use their words, which we like to say, we miss them as grievers every single time. Um, We have to be able to recognize that their play behavior is where they often tell the story. And so we have to create more experiential time, more time for them to act out, so to speak, their experiences, what their needs are. And so kids need to play. And so we have to figure out how to reintegrate that expressive component back into our schools to give them opportunities to move their body. They will tell us what their stories are. We also have to take into the de- into account the developmental stage of the child. Our younger kids don't understand the finality of death. They have, they engage in magical thinking. They can be very egotistical, um, very egocentric. And so that also means not only do they not understand the finality of death, they also think that they have more control over what happened than they actually do. And so we really have to engage in these continuous conversations to help orient them to what has happened and what is no more. Um, And one of the single best things that we can do as educators and as parents is to give children stability and structure. And so as many things as we can keep predictable as possible, the better children fare. 
um, as much information as we can give them in an age appropriate way so that they understand what's happening even if that plan needs to change, it gives them more ability, a, a better ability to regulate or to transition if we need to change courses. And so we really have to be able to understand what not only the behavioral manifestations of grief looks like, but as well as the emotional and psychological manifestations. They are not many adults. They have their own grief process that looks very differently. They grieve in spurts. It's the reason that you, you, they may be playing and they wait until you're in the car and they they only have to deal with the back of your head and they'll say, Papa died, right? And you're like, where did that come from? Developmentally, they can only manage their grief in spurts. And so they will ask the questions and then they literally need to walk away from it. Their brain has to process something else or it will simply overwhelm them. And so we have to not be caught off guard um, and to simply answer the question that has been asked, again, in an age appropriate and, and grief centered way. Um, and, and what I mean by that is we over, we desensitize children and adults in general to the finality and the, the very human experience of grief and loss, because we say things like my cell phone died. And then what happens? We charge it and it works again. So why would children believe that death is final when we use death as if it is a fluid thing, as if it is a recurring thing? Um, we say things like, you know, this loved one went to sleep. Well, we actually aren't preparing them for the finality of that transition, right? Of, of life post loss. If we simply um, attempt to distract them from their own grief experience, we have to be prepared to give them support that they need um, to really be able to express their feelings. And play is going to be um, the primary mechanism for children of all ages, even those who are, are, are adolescents that you know, may not think that they play, but their behavior tells the story. And so we have to speak their language if we're really interested and committed to understanding their experience. That is great. And when you said adolescents, I was hoping you were going to say, and adults as well, that we can all Absolutely. play our way through this. Uh, I would love to hear you mentioned about loss of routine being like a symbolic loss. Can you talk about routines and how we can kind of build them, create them, not just for our children, but also for ourselves as a way of getting through grief and trauma? Absolutely. And so we have lost the, um, the ability to transition between work and home. I don't know about you all. As long as my commute was um, that I did not enjoy, it was a, a nice a routine, right? That transition between work and home, right? I had a 30 minute window before I had to transition from being therapist to being mom. And now that window is gone, right? And so we have to create new routines for us um, at bedtime, even our morning routines. We're in a space where we're constantly accessible because we're working from home and we've lost the structure and the boundary between work and life. And so that stressor and our identity has even changed in that regard. And so we need to put things that I like to call routines, but more like rhythms, right? We routines, you know, are things that we do maybe regardless, right? Rhythms take into consideration what your body is telling you it needs. And I'd like for us to combine the two, especially as we are working through losses, because some days the routine that you need to do is honor that your body is telling you that it can't just push through that day, that it actually needs to rest for the purposes of rest and not for the purpose of being able to produce more. Um, and so I want us to get into the rhythm of what our body is actually needing. We need a bedtime routine. We need a process that allows us to put the day away. And we're seeing this because um, insomnia is up. Social media usage is up. Um, inability to stay asleep is up. Suicidality is up. Restlessness, all of these things. I haven't, I've seen more clients that are coming in for chest pain than I've seen in my 15 plus year career. And it is not biological in nature. It is psychosomatic. There's a psychological process that's happening, likely stress and anxiety that is triggering what feels like a physiological complaint that's sitting in their chest. And so we got to do something to unpack the day as well as we need a routine that starts our day. Oftentimes we start our day off in our inbox and on social media. People don't email you unless they're asking you for something, selling you something, or they, they want something from you. It immediately starts your day on someone else's agenda. I encourage people to start their day with 
self-care, doing something that, that sets the tone for their day. And so starting with self. We need routines around that. Kids need routines. And so routines and rhythms is the name of the game here. I, I appreciate all of that so much because I can certainly identify myself in way too many of the categories that you just described. And, and even though I know a lot of it's not healthy behavior, it's very difficult to separate yourself from doing it. Do you have other suggestions throughout the day? We're, we're so inundated right now with overexposure to, to COVID and, and so many of the other really difficult things that are, are happening here and around the rest of the world. How, how do we take a step away from it and give ourselves a, a little bit of peace and, and break from, from all of it? Yeah. So one thing that I, I've been encouraging my clients to do is just say no, um, say no to the opportunities that are coming your way that aren't in alignment with your energy, your time or your gifts. Um, so no is a complete sentence. It doesn't require a further explanation. And so do that on purpose for you. Um, take breaks. And so we have been working at our computers. And so we were bringing our food right along with us. No, take a break from that computer. Your brain and your body needs it. Um, you need the nourishment. Don't just continue to push through. And so take that break. Um, I have started taking certain, certain apps off of my phone. So I have to take a additional effort in order to check email or check a certain platform. I have to intentionally log into this thing. And so changing access, right, um, that people have, I think those boundaries are really important. The people who don't like your boundaries are the ones from, who benefit from you not having any. And so be okay with that, right? Um, those are some things that I certainly would appreciate. Um, people incorporating um, drink more water, the things that we just know give us what we need, right? So proper rest, taking breaks, saying no, but also um, connecting with people on purpose. Who are the folks and the things that fill your cup? Create space for that. I love these um, social media groups that are affinity groups that I'm in these organization groups, although I'm not organizing, I love watching other people organize. And so I'm giving myself permission to, you know, be inspired uh, by those things. Um, but, you know, I'm in a book club, like those are things that fill my cup where I don't have to be the expert in the room. Um, and so be in spaces where you can just be, where you're not producing, where you're not serving or teaching or whatever it is that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, where you get to take your hat off um, and just be with people um, on purpose, right, that have shared interests. And so I think we are really needing connection and community um, that's more than the things that we're good at or the things that we do to earn money. We just need things to fill our cup. And so give yourself permission to do something that fills your cup every day. That is absolutely fantastic. I love that no is a complete sentence. Uh, this has been incredible. Yes. And I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to put together a list of these at bullet points so that we can share them later because they are incredibly helpful. Uh, so I'm uh, yeah. grateful that you shared uh, all of this with us tonight. Really, really am. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Yeah, thank you for being here. This is absolutely fantastic. I, I feel energized now. I feel yeah. like I can actually get through this. I was like, we've got a lot of. Right. Tips. Yeah, there, there are actual concrete, productive things I can be doing for not just other people, but for myself. And I think that's something that a, a lot of us don't make space to do and have a lot of guilt. <laughs> that surrounds really making space and time for ourselves to be able to take care of ourselves. And, and we need to, we need to remind ourselves that we, we really can't effectively take care of anybody else if we're neglecting ourselves. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of self neglect going on right now. It truly is. And so we can, you know, just tell people, Dr. Robinson said you could do it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm yes. It's a prescription. <laughs> So uh, we will be right back after this quick message from the Lincoln Project. Uh, at this time, I will administer the oath to all senators in the chamber. Do you solemnly swear? I do solemnly swear. 
that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. You swore to this. Before God and country. You took the oath. And you broke it. Your God and your country are watching. And it's that time, time to name the winner of this week's Oh For Fuck's Sake Award, given each week to the most inane, offensive, and dangerous character in politics. Our nominees were Madison Hawthorne, Nikki Haley, and Mitch McConnell. For those who didn't win, remember, it's a dishonor just to be nominated. And our winner of the losers this week is Senate minority, I'm not going to get tired ever of saying that, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Or as a wise woman, the Senate was too sexist to confirm, called him Voldemort. Or was it Moscow Mitch? Either way, whether Mitch is dead inside or just morally dead, he is the perfect representation of a Republican Party that has lost its soul and its integrity. Most recently, Mitch pledged to support the former guy in 2024 after saying he was responsible for inciting a violent insurrection aimed at ending our democracy, thus completely cementing the GOP as the pro-authoritarian strongman party. Senator Voldemort, you are the worst of the worst this week. Well, pretty much every week. So congrats or something. <laughs> or something. So or something. we know that. <laughs> exactly. I was like, it gives the initials MM a bad name. Really does. Uh, <laughs> Moscow. <laughs> I'm like, eh, Moscow Mitch, he's never going to change. Uh, but the rest of us can work together to push forward the change we all need. So here are a few things that you can do. If you know someone who's lost someone uh, during this COVID year, reach out to them. Let them know you haven't forgotten them or the person they've lost. Uh, find out if you're eligible to get vaccinated and then please do it. And here's one, try a little extra kindness, a little extra tolerance. It's been a long year and we're all a bit afraid and you never know what someone else is going through. Yep, and catch the breakdown uh, tomorrow and every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern, 6 Pacific with Tara Setmayer and Rick Wilson. Tomorrow, their guests will be political and media historian Brian Rosenwald. And you can keep in touch with us at hashtag we're speaking, uh, our voicemail, text, Facebook. We'd love to hear from you throughout the week. We keep track of it. We share it during the show. We will be back next Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific on LPTV, the Lincoln Project's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you so much for spending time with us tonight, for sharing so many of the memories that you did of your loved ones um, through social media, for letting me share my mom with you, and you know, just for continuing to take care of one another. We'd like to leave you with this message of hope and inspiration from Lizanne, who we heard from earlier. I just, I wish people would take it seriously, wear the mask, talk to everybody, and then just march forward as a unified country. And just, we are all doing, why can't we say USA strong? You know, why, why can't we say USA strong? Why can't I be working next to a Republican and an and a independent? And why can't we all be, you know, doing this together and, and donating and, and, you know, bringing masks to people and helping? Why? I just don't understand why it has to be so divided. And it, 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 I, don't, I don't understand. But if we could all just link arms and march forward and do what we're supposed to do, 
and pick people up as we go and help people as we go, you know, maybe this, you know, this won't happen to another family. Donald Trump is not done dividing America. He's come out of hiding to find his old friend, the spotlight. On Sunday, he took the stage at the Conservative Political Action Conference in Orlando, Florida, where he lobbed insults, spread conspiracies, and lied. This election was rigged. And the, Supreme Court the same things he's done for four years, with no concern for the destruction he leaves behind. He'll get the attention he craves, after all, even condemning him feeds his insatiable need to be seen. Which is why it's more important than ever to remind ourselves that in November, one thing became clear. America is not Donald Trump. America is the people whose names you may never hear, whose only fame will be among those whose lives they touch, but who are the best of America all the same. They're doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, the people working tirelessly to get every American vaccinated against COVID-19. They're the disaster relief workers and first responders holding up their Texas neighbors during the harshest winter the state has ever seen. They're the people who show up, lend a hand, and give a damn when their fellow Americans are in need. Remember them, the lives they lead are the best proof that Trump is a liar. Because America's greatness comes from us, not him. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising.